Okay, so now you've hopefully built your first analysis of variance model using the AFX package. Um, you've built a model for a between participants design where each participant takes part uh, in a different experimental condition. We're going to move on now to examine the case of analysis of variance and building analysis of variance models for repeated measures designs. Uh, so these are designs where each of our experimental participants actually participates in all of the different experimental conditions. So we're going to focus on an example before looking to see how we would do this in R. So imagine we have an experiment where we asked uh, 32 participants to learn how to pronounce words which had differing levels of complexity. Uh, the four um, you know, levels of our factor are uh, very easy, easy, hard and very hard. So we've got four levels of our complexity factor in terms of pronunciation. So uh, participants were presented with um, words of these four types and it's a repeated measures design so everybody saw words of each of these four levels of complexity. So they were presented with these words in an initial exposure phase and then after a 30 minute break we test participants by asking them to say the words out loud when those words appeared on a computer screen. And what we're interested in in our experiment here is we want to know whether there, there is a difference in participants' response times as a function of each level of word complexity. So is it the case perhaps that words that were very hard to pronounce actually take longer to respond to during this um, you know, test, testing phase? So we've got our experimental uh, factor with four levels, repeated measures, and we've got our dependent variable, uh, which is our response time measure. So we're going to read the data in from GitHub, and we can see when we inspect the first six rows of the data using the head function, it's the same sort of issue that we had in the first video. We have condition here, but it's not yet coded as a factor. Okay, so we need to do something about that, because remember it's important that the data we're working with in R accurately reflects the experimental design that was, uh, gener you know, that was basically set up to actually generate, generate the data. So we're going to uh, do a bit of tidying. We're going to take our data that we've just read in that I mapped to a variable called rmData, and I'm just going to do a uh, mutate in the same way I did in the previous video, we're basically going to convert this condition, uh, this variable here, condition, to a factor, and we can inspect the new tidy data frame. And yep, we've actually got it now appropriately coded as a factor. So we've done minimal data wrangling to get our data frame in the right sort of format. And what we're going to do now is again the same as what we did with our uh, sort of one-way analysis of variance for between subjects designs we're going to generate some summary statistics. So we're taking our tidy data frame and then we're grouping it by condition. So that means that the next bit of code is actually going to operate basically for each level of our condition factor. And we're going to ask for the mean reaction time and the standard deviation um, reaction time for each of our experimental groups. Okay, our experimental conditions rather. So we kind of see in our summary statistics that the very hard condition does seem to have the uh, longest reaction time, so it's measured in seconds, so 1.87 seconds. The e very easy condition has got pretty quick reaction time, not too different actually from the easy condition. So the easy and very easy condition seem to have pretty similar fast reaction times with the hard uh, condition, so words with hard pronunciation, being somewhere in between the two, okay? Uh, we can also see by looking at the standard deviations that there's more variability uh, for our very hard condition than there is for the hard condition. Maybe this is what you'd expect. Um, you know, some people maybe do find the very hard condition very hard. Uh, other people maybe not quite so hard. But the standard deviation for the easy and very easy conditions are fairly equivalent. So people generally seem to uh, be more similar in terms of responding to those experimental conditions. And we can see that in the visualization as well. So again, 
I'm plotting violins to capture the shape of the distribution for our four conditions. And I'm using geom jitter to plot the raw data points as well. And we can see that the distribution of data for our very hard condition does seem to extend more widely than the distribution of our very easy and easy conditions with the hard condition being somewhere in the middle in terms of the extent of the distribution. And we can see from the um, summary statistics that I've added using the stat summary layer that the means and bootstrap confidence intervals around the means uh, are exactly as what we expect with the very easy and easy conditions being pretty similar to each other, the hard condition being higher, and then the very hard condition being higher still. And again, just to emphasize the importance of doing these kind of visualizations before you build your model, because it kind of gives you a bit of an idea as to what to expect when you actually look at your model output. So we're going to build our model in a similar sort of way as to how we built our model for our between subjects design. We're going to use the AOV4 function. And in this case, our response measure, our dependent variable reaction time, is predicted by condition. So that's kind of the same as what we had earlier. But importantly, we do something extra in our random effect term. And what we do here is that we specify our repeated measures factor. So our repeated measures factor is condition. So we define our um, random effect term in this way so that uh, AOV4 knows that condition is actually a repeated measures factor and it should accept, expect to see each of our participants in each of the four different levels of our repeated factor. Okay, so that's the only difference in terms of model specification between this kind of repeated measures design and our between subjects design. So we specify our repeated measures design, uh, factors rather, in the random effect term, otherwise the rest is the same. We can ask for the output of the model Again, we get uh, type 3, sums of squares, and we get an F value here associated with our experimental condition of 238, again with an absolutely minuscule p-value. So we actually get a few other tests down here in terms of uh, a test of sphristi. Um, and this is kind of important because um, when uh, sphristi is violated, you have to use um, slightly corrected degrees of freedom. So in this case, Mochi's test of Sphristi is significant, so we just have to be slightly careful when we uh, report the results of our analysis of variance. Um, okay, I'll say something more about that in a wee, in a wee second. So we get our output. Uh, in addition to using the summary function, we can use the ANOVA function in R. Um, so we get the ANOVA output like this, and you'll see here that we actually get correct degrees of freedom. So much of these tests were significant on the previous bit of the output, which tells us we need to use these adjusted degrees of freedom rather than uh, sort of the raw degrees of freedom. The raw degrees of freedom um, you can kind of get from get from here as, as being 3, 93. Um, the adjusted degrees of freedom are actually 1.9679 and 61.004. So that's an adjustment that's used because of the violation of sphericity. But otherwise, things are as we'd expect. And as we saw previously, we've got an F value of 238. We get the uh, generalized um, eta squared uh, effect size measure. And we get a titchy tiny p value. So the generalized uh, eta squared effect size measure is a recommended effect size measure for repeated measures designs. And you can read more about the logic behind this if you have a look at this Bakeman paper from 2005. And we've got our corrected degrees of freedom here uh, because there is a violation of sphericity. Uh, but if I recall correctly, actually, when you ask for the output of your um, repeated measures ANOVA using the ANOVA function, you'll actually get the correct uh, degrees of freedom um, just, you know, as, as a matter of default anyway. And I remember talking to Henrik about this once and he said, well, it's just a way of ensuring that you're being conservative. In other words, you're wanting to avoid type 1 errors and that's actually a pretty good idea to be as conservative as you can. And actually, even when um, sphericity isn't violated, um, which we'll 
you know, detect using that much less test, maybe it might be better off to choose it to correct it degrees of freedom anyway. Um, it's really a matter of being transparent in your write-up about what you're doing and why, okay? So this is um, what we get here. We've got a significant F ratio. We know that there's a difference somewhere between our experimental conditions, but we don't know where the difference lies. So as we did with the analysis of variance for between participants' designs, we're going to do uh, the equivalent for repeated measures designs to kind of tease apart the effect. We're going to use the EM means function in the EM means package to run pairwise comparisons. In the previous video, we saw that the default uh, adjustment method is Cheeky's correction, uh, but we can change that if we want to. We can actually set it to Bonfroni, which is what we are doing in this case. But we can also set it to adjust equal none if we don't want to do any sort of um, automated adjustment and maybe do sort of manual adjustment ourselves, depending on the experimental design that we have. When we come on to the next uh, video for factorial designs, uh, we'll look at a case where maybe actually you want to be doing the adjustments manually. So in this case, we're overriding the default and we're asking for Bonfroni correct, uh, Bonfroni corrected um, pairwise comparisons. So if we look at the output, uh, we get the estimated marginal means, which in this case are the same as our descriptive statistics, standard errors, and then uh, confidence intervals around the means for each of our four experimental conditions. And then critically, all of the different possible pairwise comparisons using Bonfroni's adjustment. Okay, so the p value reported here is automatically corrected. Um, uh, via the Bonfroni method. And what we find is that each uh, condition differs from each other condition apart from the easy versus very easy conditions. Um, and if we were to skip back to our visualization, we look down here, and yeah, not surprisingly, what we have in our pairwise comparisons backs up with backs up what we saw here. These two conditions are statistically indistinguishable, whereas this condition differs from each other condition, and this condition differs from each other condition. So again, it's just another um, nice example of you know building a visualization, first of all, having a bit of an inkling as to what you're likely to find when you build your analysis of variance model and run your pairwise comparisons. And what we see here is uh, these pairwise comparisons that are that are consistent with their expectations. So that was, uh, you know, going through how you run a repeated measures ANOVA in R for um, a, a design where you've got the same participants taking part in your different experimental groups. Um, remember that we just need to specify that design when we're using uh, the AOV4 function. We need to capture the design in our AOV4 call by having that repeated measures condition um, made explicit in the random effect structure. But otherwise, it's kind of the same as what we did with our one-way ANOVA for between participants' designs. We build the ANOVA. If it's significant, we follow it up with these pairwise comparisons. So what I'd like you to do now is work through the next bit of the worksheet, which will give you a bit of practice uh, at building you know, this, this, this model here. And then we'll move on to the final video in this workshop where we focus on factorial designs. These are the designs where we've got more than one experimental factor uh, and a case where we might be interested in how the experimental factors actually interact with each other. In other words, how somebody's performance as a function of one experimental factor is also influenced by uh, you know, um, the different levels of the other experimental factor. So have a go at uh, working through the next bit of the worksheet before watching that uh, final fourth video in this workshop and then doing um, some more work in R, building different sorts of ANOVA models. Mm -hmm.